Okay, good evening everyone and thank you for joining us. I'm delighted to welcome you to this National Centre for Sport and Exercise Medicine and Faculty of Sport and Exercise Medicine seminar on physical activity and recovery from long COVID. I'm thrilled to see how popular the session is. We've had over 450 people sign up and a very good proportion of that number uh, joining us tonight. I'm Dr Anna Lowe and I'll be your chair this evening. I'm an associate professor at Sheffield Hallam University and I'm programme manager for the National Centre for Sport and Exercise Medicine here in Sheffield. Uh, before we get into the session, I'll just talk you through a very brief bit of housekeeping. Um, so firstly, to ensure that the talks run smoothly tonight, please can we ask that all your microphones and your videos remain switched off. The talk will be recorded and we'll make it available online afterwards. If you do um, activate your video or your sound, you might unwittingly uh, make a guest appearance in that recording, which you might prefer not to do. Um, our speakers will be taking questions at the end of the session. If you'd like to ask a question, we encourage you to do so. And please use the chat function throughout the presentations to do that. During the time for questions and answers at the end, I'll do my best to select uh, suitable questions uh, and direct them to the most appropriate speaker. Uh, now, if the tech fails us, um, we'll do our very best to reconnect speakers immediately. But if we do run into problems, we'll just move on to the next speaker or the next section. I'm sure you're very familiar with these challenges by now. Um, there are one and a half CPD points available for participating in this seminar. To access them, you just need to complete the feedback form and follow the instructions that we'll send to you in the next few days via email. Um, we really do value your feedback and it will help inform future education sessions. So please do fill the form in. Um, so on to tonight's session. This session is the final one in a four part series that's been jointly hosted by the three National Centre for Sport and Exercise Medicine hubs and the Faculty for Sport and Exercise Medicine. The recordings from the first three sessions are available online and I'll pop the link into the chat shortly uh, in case you haven't attended them and are interested. Uh, so tonight's session focuses on physical activity and recovery from long COVID. This is such a hot topic and with very good reason. We know that long COVID can have a devastating impact on people's lives. It's still a relatively new phenomenon and we're still learning what a complex issue it is. Our understanding of this condition is increasing day to day and week to week. And it's really important to remember that it's in its early stages. It's hard to believe that only 18 months ago long COVID didn't exist. Um, so in tonight's seminar, we're joined by academics and clinicians who are leaders in this emerging field. And we should be mindful that the field and our knowledge is just that it's emerging. Uh, the studies we'll talk about tonight are important studies, but they're small studies that will pave the way for further research. This evening, Dr. Caroline Dalton, Dr. Rebecca Robinson and Dr. Sally Fowler-Davies will share their experience and expertise of supporting people to recover from long COVID. We had hoped to be joined by somebody with lived experience so that they could give us a personal perspective. Unfortunately, we've had to change our plans at the last minute and this hasn't been possible. Um, however, all of our speakers will do their very best to share participants' experiences through their presentations. Um, you can access the speaker's full biogs on the seminar website. So I will just give you a, a very quick run through in the interest of time. Our first speaker tonight is Caroline Dalton. Caroline is a reader in neuroscience and genetics at Sheffield Hallam University. She's theme lead for living well with chronic disease at the Advanced Wellbeing Research Centre and also leads the health and disease group in the Biomecular Sciences Research Centre at Sheffield Hallam. Our second speaker this evening is Dr. Sally Fowler-Davies. Sally is an organisational scientist and health services researcher with a clinical allied health profession background. And our third and final speaker is Dr. Rebecca Robinson. Rebecca is a consultant in sport and exercise medicine with a special interest in female athlete health and also oncology. Uh, Rebecca has been running long COVID clinics to help athletes recover recently. So, Caroline, I will hand over to you for the first presentation. Thank you. OK, thanks very much. Um, start from the beginning. Right, are we okay? We can see, see everything. Okay, so um, thanks Anna for that introduction. So she said, um, uh, told you about who I am, so I don't need to um, go through this. Um, so um, back in um, May or June last year, 
um, at the Advanced Wellbeing Research Centre, we set up um, what we called RECOVA, which is the Research and Innovation for Post-COVID-19 Rehabilitation Unit. And we started to um, do some work supporting people um, with long COVID or, or people recovering from COVID. I don't, the name long COVID hadn't really um, come into use uh, by then. Um, and um, the Advanced Wellbeing Research Centre is, um, our, our aim really is transforming, um, uh, uh, sorry, transforming lives through innovations that help people move. And I think it's really important to emphasise that, that we, we are about physical activity and we love physical activity. We encourage people um, to be physically active. I think that's a really important context um, in tonight's presentation because we're going to have quite a cautious approach and um, as Anna said this is quite a controversial subject or quite an emerging subject and I th we're very aware of the benefits of physical activity for mental health for physical health and um, I, I think all our aim is to get people back to their full health and, and really what we're discussing is what's the best way of doing that. Okay so I'm just going to cover I'm, I'm just going to briefly go over our understanding of what long COVID is so far I'm going to talk about a pilot study that we carried out at the AWRC looking at um, symptoms and um, activity in people with long COVID and then um, have some pointers towards perhaps what is the role of physical activity in recovery from long COVID. So um, NICE published a definition of long COVID, I think back in December, and defined it as signs and symptoms that develop during or after an infection consistent with COVID-19 continue for more than 12 weeks and not explain by an alternative diagnosis. It's really important that they don't specify that you need a positive test. Um, um, that a lot of the people, especially in the first wave, didn't get a positive test. So it's not necessary to have a positive test to have a diagnosis of long COVID. And um, long COVID is really a cluster of symptoms, often overlapping, which fluctuate and change over time and can affect any part of the body. And this kind of relapse remission pattern is very common and, and a lot of people with long COVID describe this to us. It's a heterogeneous multi-system um, condition and it really needs to be approached with a multidisciplinary team. And Rebecca will tell us more about that approach and Sally later in the seminar. And just to flag up that um, kids can get long COVID too and it's important to recognize that. So the symptoms are very varied. The, um, the, the, one that a lot of people have in common is exhaustion. And I've deliberately used the word exhaustion rather than just fatigue or tiredness because it's really debilitating. And the word fatigue or the word tired doesn't really describe it. It's a debilitating exhaustion. Uh, people talk about cognitive dysfunction or they describe it as brain fog, finding it difficult to concentrate, finding it difficult to remember things, finding it difficult to um, find words. Uh, people describe shortness of breath, headache, migraine, chest pressure and tightness, muscle pains and aches. And, um, uh, and, and these are really some of the symptoms that people have during the acute phase, but they, they linger. And, um, and um, people actually tell us that some of these symptoms, are, although the exhaustion is there all the time, some of these other symptoms are, um, can be more um, difficult to live with. Um, some people have um, what you could describe as an autonomic nervous system dysfunction or orthostatic intolerance. So they find, um, um, they find it difficult to um, uh, do activities that involve standing up or um, they find that their heart rate really spikes when they stand up. Um, and then people have what we call um, post-exertional malaise or post-exertional sy symptom exacerbation. I'm going to go into more detail about this in a bit. And then I want to mention anxiety and depression. So people with long COVID, some people have anxiety and depression. I want to make it really clear that this is secondary to having long COVID. It's not the cause of long COVID. So a lot of the people we've talked to say that when they go to their GP, particularly if they say they've got um, their heart is racing or they're breathless, their GP says, oh, you're just anxious and tries to um, treat their long COVID by treating anxiety. It's important that people have support for their anxiety, but they're anxious because they've acquired a devastating condition and they, they don't know how long it's going to go on for. It's dramatically affecting their life. It might be affecting their ability to go to work, to earn money, to look after their kids, look after their family. And that's what's causing the anxiety and depression. It's not that 
the anxiety and depression is causing long COVID. And I think that's really important to emphasise. We need to support people with anxiety, their anxiety and depression, but it's not what's driving their long COVID. So how common is long COVID? So there were a couple of studies that came out of, from the ONS, the um, National Statistics, um, during March. So one was the one that you might have seen the big headlines about, the 1.2 million people, but they also um, uh, talked about this other one, which they, so the 1.2 million study, they just asked people, have you got long COVID? Which is, which is fine. And 1.2 million people said, yes, I've got long COVID. But this study, um, which they also brought out, they actually tracked 20,000 people who'd had a positive test and actually followed them up. And 12 weeks after their initial infection, they followed them up and they found that 14% had symptoms. Um, most of these people had a mild illness. I, I don't think people, most people would describe it as a mild illness, but a, a, a non-hospitalized illness. It was slightly more common in women, which is interesting in this group because um, the people in, who are turning up in long COVID clinics are very strongly overwhelmingly women. And yet when in this tracking study, it was only, it was only women that were slightly more common that were likely to have long COVID. Um, the age group most affected in this data was 24 to 34, which again contrasts with the 1.2 million study, which was a slightly older age group. But the point is, it's not the same people who were in hospital, it, it, you know, that were hospitalized with, long, uh, with COVID. It's a different demographic. And interestingly, people who were actually treated in hospital seem less likely to have long COVID. However, we've got to recognize that they do have many post COVID issues with their health and they need support. And this is, this is a slightly complicated issue because um, people who were hospitalized tend to have something that looks a bit more like post pneumonia or post hospitalization syndrome, and they need support with that. But is that long COVID or isn't it long COVID? It, it kind of fits with um, the a nicest definition in that they have symptoms after 12 weeks, but it doesn't seem to be quite the same phenotype as the, this younger group. Um, and then obviously somewhere in the middle, there's a blur between the two groups. And, and that's particularly difficult to manage because it's possible that the hospitalized group need different recommendations for physical activity than the younger group. And, um, and I'll explain why that is as we go along. I, we are worried, and this is one of the things that Sally and Rebecca are going to talk about as well. That there are a lot of missing patients that aren't turning up at clinics, aren't, turn, aren't accessing healthcare. So people who seek health at long COVID clinics seem to be more likely to be women, report that they were previously physically active, they're more likely to be white, they're more likely to be economically advantaged. And it's just not plausible that that is the demographic of people with long COVID. There's got to be some missing people. And I really think that we need to go out and look for these people, um, not just wait for them to come approach the healthcare system. Um, so some of these people may just be feeling awful, but not, you know, not have, um, not know they've got long COVID. They've not really, um, it, that's not been on their radar and they just feel they're just struggling on. Or some people may have identified they've got long COVID and just feel there's nothing that can be done or the healthcare system is nothing to do. And we can work out how many of these people there might be, because if we go on that 14% figure, we know how many in each area had COVID. You can work out what 14% of that number is. And like, let's say it's between 10 and 20 or whatever. There's a whole load of people that um, don't seem to be accessing the help that um, perhaps they, they could. What do we know about what causes long COVID? So, the, probably the most likely explanation is that persistent inflammation causes long COVID. That, um, that after COVID, people's bodies still have a lot of um, kind of background inflammation going on. And the thing is that when you've got a background inflammation in your body, your body um, puts your, um, encourages you to rest. So it does that by making you feel extremely fatigued. And then whenever you've got an additional stress on the body, like doing activities, doing anything, um, it will flare up symptoms again to make sure that you really, really feel exhausted and terrible so that you rest. So that's, that's quite a good explanation. There could be an autoimmune effect and that um, kind of goes with the um, more women having it. And several of the people that we've worked with 
had been tested for autoantibodies and found and they, they had autoantibodies. So this, then you're into something that looks a bit more like rheumatoid arthritis, something like that, an autoimmune condition. These are not um, mutually exclusive, by the way. Um, the cover scan study where they did some really in-depth scanning um, found endothelial damage, found my, um, thrombosis, micro thrombosis. So that's another um, cause potentially. Um, and that, um, and they picked up quite a lot of organ damage in some people, but not all people by any means, but some people. And then some people have a theory that there might be persistent virus. I mean, the, the gut microbiome has all sorts of stuff in it, you know, bacteria, fungi, virus, so it could be lurking in there. I think there's not that much evidence for that theory, but, you know, we can't completely rule it out. So um, the one thing I should say is that but despite people having lots of tests, often those tests come back negative. That does not mean there's not something physically wrong. It just means the tests aren't turning stuff up. So the cover scan study, um, they did much more in-depth scans and they that turned up a lot of stuff. So I'm just gonna tell you briefly about this pilot study we did. So we did a pilot study with 25 people with long COVID. So this was back in December. It was a four week study and we had an app and we collected data about symptoms. So people filled it in a couple of times a day, it took them less than a minute to fill it in. And um, they inputted on, um, had, uh, inputted information about their sleep, whether they felt breathless, what their fatigue was like, did they feel lightheaded? Did they have brain fog? How anxious did they feel? And we asked them on a sliding scale, how much energy do you think you have? And then we asked them um, about what they've been doing in the last few hours, how active they've been. And then we also, during one of the weeks, the both four weeks, we asked them to wear an activity monitor. And we also, the week they wore the activity monitor, they filled in the, the um, data collection more frequently during the day. And then we um, did various surveys at baseline four week and four months. So um, things like the IPAC measuring how physically active they were um, and various other measures. And then we followed some of the people up, about a quarter of them up with an interview at four months. Um, and so this was collaboration with um, Chris Burton at the University of Sheffield, Helen Dawes at Oxford Brooks, and then Simon Goodwill at um, the AWRC. So this uh, is a few screenshots from the app just to show you the sort of thing people are filling in. And this is the sort of data we get. So at the top, we've got the data for the symptoms. So this is five different people across the top. And then each of them, we've got measures for seven different um, uh, seven different uh, symptoms. So um, if you take this person right in the middle here, you can see that they, they're scoring really high for a lot of symptoms, but their symptoms are very um, consistent. Okay, so there's not a lot of variability from day to day. If you take this person towards the right here, they've got some symptoms where they score quite high, like fatigue, it's really high. Um, but then some symptoms they don't have at all. If you take this person right on the left, they're very variable. They've got a lot of variability in their symptoms. So we can begin to pick up differences between different people using this method. And then the second block, um, which don't match the top actually, is from three people and the activity monitor. So the one on the left, somebody who's really not very active at all. Someone in the middle, they're really quite active. And then the one on the right is someone who's sort of intermediate. They're a bit active, but not very active. Okay, so from this, we um, started to put people into groups. And I've simplified it actually with the groups because some people were kind of on the borderline between some groups, but you could sort of start to see patterns. So we have some people here in the top right with the green, who their symptoms are quite under control. They're, they're not reporting loads of symptoms and they're quite active. And really these people are kind of recovered or on the way to recovery. Then we've got some people who their symptoms aren't too bad, but they're inactive. Okay, so we probably want to get them a bit more active maybe, but we'll come to that in a minute. <laughs> then we've got some people who are active, which we think might be good, but then they've got, they're, they're really bothered by their symptoms. And then we've got some people who are really bothered by the symptoms and they're not active at all. They're really quite unwell. So what do we want to happen? We want the inactive people to become more active and but they still have controlled symptoms. 
We want the people who've got poor symptom control to stay active, but then who are active, stay active, but then their symptoms get better. And we want the people who are inactive and they've got lots of symptoms to, to get better, really. We want them to have their symptoms under control and become more active. So sometimes the advice that people have reported they're given in order to achieve this objective, they're told things like, try and do a little bit each day. Try and build up your level of activity each day. Don't worry if you feel tired because that's normal, you've been poorly. Ignore your symptoms, just push through. It's probably deconditioning actually, the more you do, the better you'll start to feel, okay? Patients find say to us that this, following this advice doesn't work. And instead what happens is that if they've got their symptoms under control, but they're inactive and they start becoming active, they lose control of their symptoms and their symptoms start coming back. Or worse than that, not only do their symptoms come back, but they, um, when they're active, but then they stop being active and, they st and now their symptoms are back and they've relapsed. So they're in the worst place than they were before because before they, their symptoms were under control and they were inactive, but now they've got their symptoms back and they're still inactive. And then some of the people who've got poor symptom control but were active, if they do more on top of that, they feel even worse. And then they become inactive because they, they relapse. So I would say this is probably, this, this advice isn't, according to the people we talked to, doesn't work. It may work for some people, okay? I, because it's a heterogeneous group. And for some people, it may be okay. We don't, and, and how we know the difference between those people, it's really hard to tell. And that's one of the real challenges of long COVID. But for a lot of people, this advice doesn't work. So why is it that this advice doesn't work? Oh yeah, and the, this is it's the patient voice, some, some quotes from some of the patients. So, so one of our um, participants said, whenever I tried to do anything, it seemed to be a stress for my body. So she was kind of describing trying to become more active and it just not working. And, and she said, um, we're not pretending, you know, we just don't have any energy. We, it's not like if we try to think ourselves to be active, we can suddenly be active. We seriously don't have any energy. So why is this? What's going on? So I, this is, I'm, you remember I mentioned post-exertional malaise or post-exertional symptom, it's aspiration. This could be one of the things that's going on with some of these people. And again, I emphasize it may not be everybody, but it's sufficiently a pattern of what people describe to be a, a thing that lots of people seem to have. So here we've got a, an activity, okay? Probably physical activity, like going 10 minute walk to the shop, say. It could be a cognitive activity, it could be um, taking part in a meeting like this and giving a presentation. It could be, you know, um, uh, uh, trying to bust up a fight between your kids, it, um, an emotional activity. But let's say it's a 10 minute walk to the shops. So quite a small thing, not a big stress, okay? But what people with long COVID sometimes find, often find, is that their symptoms come back. So they get this exacerbation post exertional exacerbation of their symptoms and their exhaustion, their brain fog, their muscle aches, pains, disturbed sleep, flu-like symptoms, headaches all come back if they were under control already or they get worse. Okay, oops, sorry. What's that? Sorry, I don't know why that, oh, sorry, that's my next slide. Yeah, okay. And um, so there's a couple of things that are really important to notice about this, right? One is that this delay Okay, and this delay really catches people out, okay? Because they wake up one day and they think, yeah, do you know what, I feel quite good. I think I'll go for a walk. And then the next, that evening or the next morning, they still feel okay-ish and they think, oh, well, that was okay. I think I'll clean the bathroom or something. And um, the trouble is that they're already beginning to be into this post succession malaise thing. And what this is, is the body saying, oh, well, hang on a minute, we've got persistent inflammation here. You don't want to be walking to the shops. That's the stress. That's going to make you feel worse. And, they, and your body switches on all the things that are going to get you on the sofa and make you stay on the sofa while you recover. So the trouble is that if you start doing more than one thing, so you do activity two episodes in a row, like say two days in a row, so the advice like go for a walk to the shops every day, you get a buildup, you get a cumulative effect of this post exertional malaise. So now you're into kind of relapse territory. So, and the trouble is that this 
somebody who, say, is trying to hold down a job is going to find this, okay? They're going into work every day. Their symptoms are going to build up. So they might have rested over the weekend. They go back to work and wonder if they don't feel too bad. And over the week, this malaise or this um, symptom exacerbation is going to build up. So some of what's going on when people with long COVID respond poorly to physical activity is post-exertion malaise. It's this um, problem. So how do you get around it or what can you do? Or how does this, so, yeah. So first of all, what's happening with these different groups of people? So first we've got our recovered people. They're probably okay. And if they do physical activity, they're probably not going to experience post-exertion malaise, we don't know. These people, however, probably are controlling it at the moment by limiting their activity. So they need to be quite cautious about increasing activity. And just kind of take it really easy. These people, particularly if their activity is um, maybe being at work or something like that, they might just be in permanent post-exertion malaise. Or if they're the sort of people that are trying to go to the shops every day for 10 minutes, and really that's beyond what their body is ready for at the moment. They might just, their brain fog and everything, their symptoms might just be a sort of permanent state of this. And then this group, even activities of daily living might be causing post-exertion malaise. So um, people talk to us about it, just standing up and having a shower wears them out. Or it could be that this group of people have underlying organ damage and they're really severely ill and it's nothing to do with post-exertion malaise and it's to do with, or it, it's additional and that they really need further investigation. So some of the people in our study recovered um, in fact, after, when we went back after about four months, about a third of our group were much, much better. About a third of our group had improved and there were kind of third that were a bit stuck. So, and that's a year on because most of them had long well, COVID in the first wave, so a year on. And that seems like a really long time. But actually, when you think about things like maybe recovering from really bad pneumonia or something, a year actually is, you know, it can take a year. So maybe some people or most people will get better eventually. The people that we spoke to who got better, that we interviewed, attributed their recovery to what some of them, someone described as extreme rest. Now, it's only a few people, so you could say it's an anecdote. They said things like, I rested a lot and slept whenever I could. I listened to my body and that helped a lot. I know how important it is to rest and how damaging it is to push through. So they said rest was really important. And I think that's what we so what could we recommend to our groups of people? So our green people, they're okay. I think we could say that the, the people who are inactive, but their symptoms are under control, could cautiously increase their activity, but they really need to monitor their symptoms and really take it easily and slowly. These people who are active, but their symptoms are not under control, if they dial that activity down, they may find that they get some of their symptom control back. So for example, if you've got someone who's... Um, trying to hold down a job and yet in the evening they're also trying to meet up with friends or they're trying to go for a run or they're um, taking the kids to kick a football around the park or they're trying to keep on top of the housework and then when in the weekend they go for a walk in the countryside or something it's just too much and it may be that if they're at work but that's the only thing they can do that's active at the moment and they need to try and rest as much as possible and some people say that's ridiculous you've got kids to look after it's just not possible and I appreciate that but if they try and pull back and not you know try and leave the housework for a couple of weeks even though that I know that's really difficult and try to rest they might get some more symptom control this group are really difficult the poor symptom control inactive group, I don't think we can recommend that they try and increase their activity. I think we have to work on getting their symptoms to improve. And so what we would hope is that the inactive people become active um, by, you know, because they're being careful. We'd hope that the, post, the poor symptom control people by becoming a little bit more inactive, control their symptoms, but then they can reintroduce activity. So what about managing symptoms? I think Sally, this is a phrase from Sally, legitimizing inactivity. And this is sort of what I was saying about not rushing around doing the housework or um, that if, if um, we should encourage people to rest and that doesn't mean 
if they were going for a walk, that they stop going for a walk and hoover the carpet instead. It's, you know, if they need to rest, it's really frustrating to be doing that and really difficult. Uh, so people need to concentrate on stabilizing their symptoms. If symptom control is poor, they try and decrease activity for a temporary period, not permanently for a temporary period. If possible, it might not be possible. Don't forget sleep quality. So um, some people try and push through without having a nap in the day, and that's fine if it works for them. But some people we've talked to say, well, I tried not to have a nap, and then at seven o'clock I, I crashed and I slept for half an hour, and then it was I slept terribly in the night. Those people might be better having a nap at 12 o'clock or one o'clock and what I might I call a preemptive nap. You know, if you can't get through the day without a nap, have it earlier and then it won't impact on your nighttime sleep. So that's something to consider. Um, some communities have gone trodden this journey before. So the chronic fatigue syndrome, ME have before that and they know all about pacing and energy conservation and, and in the resources um, uh, I've put a link to the ME association site and they've got lots of resources about pacing and energy conservation um, and people with traumatic brain injury as well have, have, um, know about this as well so this is really important to work out what uh, people describe an energy envelope and not going outside your energy envelope you could call it don't go into the red zone don't only do what you can within your energy so if you need if you want to go for a walk go for a walk but don't then try and clean the bathroom straight afterwards for example, you know, you have to work out what you want to prioritise and stay within the amount of energy you have. Uh, people described using cognitive function strategies as being really helpful to get through this. Using planners, memory aids, um, some cognitive training programmes online that they, um, some people found helpful. Um, remembering the activity that might stress people or tire them out can include interacting with social media, chatting with friends, watching TV, housework, cooking. So it's not just physical activity that's tiring. And so when you're thinking about reducing activity, you have to kind of look at things in the whole. So when we're thinking about reduced, resuming activity, I think it's really important that we talk to people and ask them about this delayed response to doing activity and try and make them aware of it to give them control oh, um, so that they can choose what they do, but they know that they're sort of um, able to manage their activity themselves. Uh, it's important to rule out things like myocarditis before anyone does goes back to activity who has long COVID. It, um, important to exclude exertional oxygen desaturation or monitor for reduced oxygen saturation. Um, important to um, uh, uh, consider autonomic dysfunction as well. So the, really the key message is try and stabilize symptoms, try and focus on stabilizing symptoms first, and then resume activities once symptoms are stabilized slowly and cautiously. Consider post-exertional malaise, so not everybody has it, but a lot of people have it. And um, don't increase activity incrementally if, if, if symptoms sort of come back and increase and rest between activities, and it might need to be days. So if someone goes, wants to go for a walk on the weekend, they might have to rest three or four days before they do it again. So it's this thing about not allowing it to build up and recovering after each episode of activity in the early days while you're testing it. And what um, some people describe to us as, as they got better, that rest gap could get smaller. And also that the post-exertion malaise got lower and smaller until gradually it kind of merged in what would be a normal response to physical activity, you know, feeling a bit tired the next day or immediately afterwards. Just one more minute, Caroline. Great. I've, I think I'm on my last but one slide. Um, so um, it's important to build rest into your schedule and don't push through like one of our participants said. Some people um, described that they, they could tolerate physical activity but if it was seated or supine. Um, especially people with orthostatic intolerance and they um, also tolerated things like yoga and stretching more than aerobic exercise and some people found that using a heart rate monitor was useful um, as well to keep their heart rate in certain limits 
so this is a quote so at the end of the study we said um tell us one thing that you think is really the most important thing and this is one of the quotes in answer to that question it's very important that healthcare professionals she actually said gps but uh, don't push the patient to exercise because that's the worst thing they can do and i think what she's saying is the patients know their bodies best okay so it's it don't make them do something that they don't feel able to do yet um I just wanted to mention the autonomic system, which I'm going to gloss over quickly because Anna's given me the time thing. But um, it looks like breathing and considering breathing and breathing exercises are really helpful, particularly for that group that are stuck, you know, with symptoms and inactive. Um, so they should, maybe should focus on that rather than worrying about activity for now. So rest really important. We need to personalise advice. We need to... Um, Think about personal exertion malaise, but and titrate activity by symptoms. So not set activity targets like try and walk 10 minutes every day or something like that. Hopefully controlled breathing is a good intervention and um, people are getting better. They are getting better. It's, um, but the ability to rest, and that's not equal across all demographics, seems to be a predictor. And I've just put some resources here. There's a paper, um, World Physiology Physiotherapy paper that's coming out that we're contributing to. Long COVID physio is really good because physios are really enthusiastic about physical activity, but they've had long COVID, so they are really good at balancing caution and enthusiasm. Uh, paper on long, on post-exertion ways if you want to dive into it. And if you search for long COVID on the ME Association, there's loads of resources there. And long COVID SOS is a patient group um, who's led on this, really. They've been... The, the people who are the experts, the, the patients are the experts. They've been living with this for a year and they they know what's going on and, and we need to learn from them really. Brilliant. I think, I think that's it. Thank you. That's a great, gone. great note to finish on there, Caroline. Well, I've only patients gone over by five minutes. So. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, so just a quick reminder to the audience to pop questions for Caroline and uh, Sally and Rebecca into the chat as we go along. And uh, we'll, we'll come on to questions after the next presentation. So I will hand straight over to Sally, if that's OK. Thanks, Anna. Um, sorry, I'm just going to see if I can do the slideshow. It's not this at the moment, but it will. I'm glad other people's dogs bark in the background. I'm sorry, everyone. I'm just trying to get to the slideshow, Pete. Um, thing and it just won't do it for me. I'll see if I can do it at the bottom here. I'm going to I'm going to do it like this. Oh, we practiced too, didn't we? Here we are. There we go. Okay. Um, thanks very much for the invitation. Um, Rebecca and I have been working together now for about three months on this project, which we were very fortunate to have funded by Sport England. Um, it was part of their lottery funding um, and they were really interested and concerned, I suppose, about the, uh, the opportunities for people in what we call underserved communities to engage with rehabilitation um, and around, uh, around long COVID and when we when we talk about this, we're very conscious of the fact that the AWRC, which is where Caroline, Caroline and I and, and Anna all work um, as academics, they, we're very conscious of the fact that we exist in this lovely building, but right in the centre of one of the most deprived communities in the city of Sheffield. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about the nature of uh, the work and, and the partnership working that we've undertaken today, up to date. And then I'm going to also, and obviously Rebecca is going to talk very specifically about some of the ideas that we've had in relation to the co-production with the people that we've been working with. 
So this was a, a project that was funded by um, a kind of an, uh, a sport entity, but really was foc- But what really what we focused on is the uh, engaging with health professionals to really understand how we can work together and also offer this integrated personalised care, which is absolutely at the centre of the health and care policy now. So we wanted to focus on a programme of work that was su- that was support what we called innovative solutions, but we really wanted to kind of engage with participants around this negative impact. And widening, uh, we know that COVID has widened inequalities um, across our city, uh, but has definitely widened them across uh, the whole country as well. And, and in actual fact, long COVID in a way is an opportunity to work for somebody like me who's interested in population health outcomes. It's been a real opportunity to really engage with um, a new disease without a fixed pathway within the healthcare setting. And that in, in itself offers an opportunity for innovation. So we, back in um, April last year, I undertook a piece of work about the incidence of COVID across the city of Sheffield, Um, just really to start to highlight for colleagues across the health and care system, the the local inequalities that were being shown up. So this heat map is a picture of hospitalisations based on postcode from April to August 2020. So it was effectively took into account the first wave, the first surge of the pandemic. This is COVID itself, and it is only about hospitalizations. But what I can tell you is the map here showing uh, all of that kind of hot area, that was all, that's a bunch of individual dots showing the incidence of Sheffield around S2, S4, S5, and, and, and areas around here and a little bit more around S7, but there's a reason for that. And so that map almost exactly um, shows us that our city is split into east and west. Areas of the worst deprivation are to the east and areas of the least deprivation are to the west. So we can see and we knew from this that that, uh, COVID-19 had really done what everybody was saying, which it was showing up the areas where there was low resilience, higher multiple morbidity, um, and certainly through the social and economic behaviours that people were forced to undertake, particularly uh, those without a furlough opportunity, it was really important that we kind of started to recognise in health and care and redesign our services to um, think about a kind of more transformational approach in relation to working with people. And and we knew knew this disparity existed in the city. um, And so we we recognise that there's a 15 year difference in life expectancy uh, between these two areas. So uh, our project had a number of aims. I'm going to share those with you. We're not quite finished yet, um, but I wanted to kind of really focus on that we were looking at developing this clinical academic infrastructure so that we could work alongside the, the NHS hubs that have been set up for long COVID. Um, we wanted to test into interventions. We've included in our team two people who are actively engaged um, as researchers with us, but also who work in the long COVID hubs within the city. So they have an opportunity to kind of test and learn and take those ideas back into the NHS clinics on a, on a kind of an immediate basis. We, are, we co-produced an intervention that was acceptable to the local community. And what you'll see from what we've done is that there were there are almost there were no there was nobody in our group who had presented in any active way either to their GP or to um, to the local NHS long COVID hub uh, based on the symptoms that they were experiencing. 
So um, that's been almost a, uh, an interesting finding in itself that our local community just don't uh, identify some of these issues to do with fatigue and breathlessness as a high enough priority for them to seek healthcare. Um, we wanted to engage participants to learn about what mattered to them. Um, we, we came from that position. I think our original bid was uh, in relation to this long haul. So we wanted to recognise that people beyond 12 weeks were going to come forward and we were going to kind of search them out. We didn't know how we were going to do that initially. Um, and we wanted to utilise this ongoing development of evidence and practice understanding um, from elite sport, from sport and exercise medicine and from rehabilitation. So we've been really keen to bring together a group of um, very experienced practitioners um, to really th sort of think through together um, and share those outcomes widely. So um, those of you who have ever done any work in public health will be extremely familiar with this diagram by Dahlgren and Whitehead. And it really kind of is the baseline for our study that we recognise that some of these general socioeconomic and cultural environmental conditions are what uh, put, puts people at higher risk of both getting COVID, but then, of course, um, by, vir by virtue of the information that Caroline's get us, we have a reasonable hypothesis that there will be a higher incidence of long COVID in this community. Um, but perhaps more significantly, those people do not come forward to seek services and they simply deprioritize by virtue of all the other pressures and all the other considerations in their life, including unemployment and housing and, and family and uh, much of which would be familiar to many anybody and many of us. Um, but somehow this has this is compounded by difficulties associated with health literacy or language or IT use. It's always the way that your dog barks, but only when you're speaking. <laughs> Apologies for that. So um, we have some cross-cutting principles within the uh, Advanced Wellbeing Research Centre. We really, all of our work places the person at the heart of the research. We want to empower people to make sustainable lifestyle changes. We want people to participate in our work and in our research, which is, uh, and that's an absolute foundational principle to the study too. Um, one, of the, one of the kind of focuses on physical activity, if you like, the context of our physical activity work is on this notion of understanding and developing population health and well-being and developing these co-production approaches. So, what I realised, and I think we all realised as a team quite early on, was that by virtue of sitting in our beautiful building, or indeed during the COVID times working from home, our access to some of our uh, community participants was going to be extremely limited. Um, but we're very, very fortunate to be able to work with a partner organisation at the heart of the community called Darnell Wellbeing. And this is a, a 20 year old local, hyper local, I would say, not for profit community health organisation um, who, whose mission is to work to help people of Darnell, Tinsley and neighbouring areas to stay healthy. Now, we had some pre-existing um, we had some pre-existing uh, relationships with them. But it very interestingly, during this time, they have been like a lot of third sector organisations, stretched extremely thinly in terms of their support and networking opportunities, partly by virtue of their, their limited IT resource. But they were extremely willing and able to come forward and to help us uh, to identify people within the community who they knew within their networks were having particularly the experiences of um, excessive fatigue and breathlessness and so those people were recruited by our colleague uh, Wakas Hamid 
who um, was is really interested and was interested in becoming an associate um, associate uh, researcher at Darnell Wellbeing. So that was a, a fantastic opportunity. We've been trialing that all the way through, looking at how we can work really closely with these new and different roles to engage people um, right across the communities. So finally, probably the thing that Anna was saying is of most interest to people. One, um, I'm going to tell you a, a, the story about just a number of our participants who we've seen um, three times during our study. Uh, everybody had an, un, uh, an undertaking to have three virtual meetings with us to talk about their uh, experience of COVID, but more specifically about long COVID. And then uh, to, to engage with us around negotiating um, very, very simple, personalized steps towards uh, feeling better, I suppose, is, is the simple term. So we had our first participant was a 43 year old Pakistani man. He was a taxi driver. And I think very importantly, in relation to issues associated with hardship, taxi drivers have been very, very hard hit. They are um, peace workers. So, uh, you know, if they work, they get paid. If they don't work, they don't get paid. They're on a, effectively a sort of zero hours contract. Um, this gentleman had long COVID in March 2020. Um, <clears throat> he had a, a, a lot of taste and smell and, and a fever, but with very, very extreme and diffused pain uh, with breathlessness, breathlessness. And he was a walker, so he very quickly picked up on this post-exertional malaise. Um, the pain uh, had been checked out by many, many uh, attendances at outpatient clinics, um, but he simply had then been told that nothing was problematic for him and so uh, not, nothing showed up in the test so obviously he he was left at that point then we had um, a 75 year old man a, a white british man a retired electrical engineer um, multiply morbid with uh, osteoarthritis copd um, and other other and he was experiencing very acute breathlessness stopped going out very isolated uh, during the lockdown due to a relatively recent divorce um our participant sevens a 53 year old woman syrian Im immigrant of 10 years with four children um and somebody who uh, who had a very very severe cough during her covid experience lost her taste but was is now extremely breathless fatigued but also very much showing signs of menopausal symptoms limited energy loss of drive but but very engaged actually much more the pattern of the sort of person that uh, caroline was talking about who is really um eager to get well very very driven in lots of, in in the way that they want to kind of engage with their treatment but just finding herself completely without the ability to do so and finally just as a contrasting example um participant nine is a 61 year old woman recently be bereaved and divorced um had covid uh, uh tested positive now extremely breathless just utterly tearful hopeless fatigued um and really worried about not going out uh, going anywhere in fact or, or engaging in any kind of activity so i think a really mixed picture for us of people who uh who were willing to come forward talk to us about what their experience was so before we did anything, we, we co-divined um, what the barriers were to identifying participants. We recognised that we were going to partner with um, Darnell Wellbeing. We, we knew the lockdown context would mean that we were going to be using online methods with the community where that was going to be uh, quite challenging. We, provide, we, we wanted to do realistic measurements that, that could be used where we would really engage with people in terms of self-monitoring and self-care. We wanted to uh, adopt and normalise a sort of community practice. We wanted to reach into the community and offer something really hyper local. We weren't getting people to come to our clinics at a time of day. And it's been actually really challenging meeting that very varied need. 
And finally, we took an approach that was really personalised and really aimed to learn from the sport and exercise medicine. So I want to hand over to Rebecca uh, at this point um, as a key partner within this study to talk about that whole sport and exercise medicine um, approach. Thank you very much, Sally. Um, and thank you to Team at National Centres for inviting me today. Um, we've heard a lot of interesting thoughts and evidence so far about what long COVID means and what that might mean in terms of people's reduced exercise capacity. So I think having learned a little bit about what we're offering as a service, it's important to maybe take a step back and for me probably to explain why on earth would sport and exercise be involved in a condition where we're saying that exercise might not be at least immediately the answer. So I'm going to just explain a little bit about what sports exercise physicians do. Um, I'm a consultant in sports medicine with a background in hospital medicine. Some of my colleagues train more in GP or accident and emergency medicine. So we're quite a varied group. And traditionally, you'll find us in the NHS working with musculoskeletal injuries, sometimes in chronic pain. We also work in sports medicine. And I think that's important because in the elite sports setting, such as the English Institute of Sport, which if we were in the real world right now, we'd be doing this um, probably from the Advanced Wellbeing Research Centre, which is right next to the English Institute of Sport um, in Sheffield. We work with a team there. So elite sport medicine is really based around this multidisciplinary team and we're not the ones prescribing exercise. We're the ones helping with the illness and injury and getting people back to what they wanna do. So in our team, quite normally, there is medicine, physiology, physiotherapy, nutrition, psychology. There's a whole team around lifestyle supporting even before we get to the athlete at the center and their coach. So. In that environment, we can help people to win medals, but we can also help them when things go wrong, where there's an unexpected injury, and sometimes there's a significant illness that means that they can't train. So there's a good space, I believe, for moving that model into the sphere of the NHS and applying that to long-term conditions. And we already do that in sports and exercise medicine. We do work alongside often rehabilitation medicine who also work in that sphere, and I think this, time is showing us that there's a really good scope for future collaborations. So in exercise medicine, we use physical activity to help to retain or get back physiological capacity. And that's before, during or after illness. Um, as Anna mentioned in the introduction, I work in exercise medicine with cancer as well. And so for example, sometimes someone going through treatment, it'll be about trying to get them a small bit fitter and that might not be running a 5K, that might be helping them get up the stairs before a treatment. Sometimes we're not looking to build during and we know that rest is really, really important. And we can face some of the same issues around significant fatigue after something like cancer or a long-term condition. So we know we have to moderate what people do but we can very much use the sports model where we very specifically individualize a program around someone so those are some of the principles that shape some of our initial discussions designing this and ultimately we want to promote wellness through increased physical activity but looking at that in a more holistic sphere when we look at the overall the whole person so we can ask you for the next slide if that's okay sunny thanks thank you in the post-covid world where is sport exercise medicine? So we do exist in post-COVID clinics and my colleagues are working in these um, in the NHS. We are also still managing athletes who are training at the moment um, as this was an elite athlete dispensation from the Department of Culture, Media and Sport in the English Institute of Sport. So we've had a number of athletes experience post-COVID symptoms and syndrome and have therefore had to have a real team approach to their management. And that really is about getting them well before we even think about training. We do also work in the private sector and in some cases people have looked to that area to meet their needs when they've not been able to access or have been wanting to seek help in different ways. So um, I think the bottom quote is actually from a, a colleague who um, works in rehabilitation medicine, um, Professor Sivan, who said the most pressing need for rapid learning to understand what represents good multidisciplinary care in formed by real world outcome data and patient experience in a, in a multidisciplinary model, that should say. Um, so really this was, this was a lovely quote from the British Medical Journal um, just last week. And 
um, this was talking about rehabilitation medicine and the long COVID clinics exist, but saying there is a call that we can do more as a multidisciplinary team and we can have different specialties to help co-lead that. So I do believe that there is a real role for sports exercise medicine as well as rehabilitation medicine. And sometimes we have that capacity to take on the roles around rehabilitation, but listen to the patient's story and diagnose and work through the issues that they've had. And I'll explain how that's done on the next slide. So going back to our project, what we did first is identify and recruit. And as Sally explained, that was through working with the team within Donald within this part of Sheffield that we knew that there was a high need and that we wanted to try and facilitate patients accessing care. But we, we said from the outset, we're clear that this is a research um, project. So we want to support people. We also want to learn from their stories. So very important to have patients full consent to participating. Obviously, if someone felt that was not for them when they entered, then we didn't take that process further. But what we did need to attain at the start was a minimum data set. So we did that thoroughly and looked at any reasons for excluding, which were quite few really, and including patients from whatsoever realm in terms of their long COVID experience they came from. So when we had a patient recruited and we're actually still seeing some of our patients now, which is um, which is great. We started with an initial session and I'll come into um, the discussion around what we do in that session first um, in, in a moment. And then we would offer two more sessions to follow up. And the intervals between those would depend usually sort of a couple of weeks to see where the patient was getting to if we were helping them. And we're learning through that process and very much listening too. So in those initial sessions, we'd usually have um, one of the doctors, so I was working with two other um, colleagues in sports exercise medicine, and then a colleague an allied health professional, so from the realms of physiotherapy, occupational therapy, um, to listen as well and co-host that session. What we would undertake in an hour, which was shorter if we knew that someone was having difficulties with their neurocognitive um, capacity and concentration, so it was really tailored to the patient, but we'd want to find out about how they had experienced COVID and where their health was before, how things had changed. From the minimum data set before, we had quite a lot of markers and validated questionnaires around their health. We really wanted to learn what had changed for that patient um, and what was important to them. And obviously it's important as well to undertake quite a thorough medical review. We know that long COVID has a whole host of symptoms that just keep evolving and we keep learning. We also know that there are other things that can cause some of those symptoms and we needed to be very thorough and make sure that those weren't the case. And we also wanted to make sure that we quite well signposted people to resources. So we worked alongside the community and made sure that they had links back into their GP should we need to access other areas of healthcare because we weren't trying to provide a service that um, managed some of the other complications of COVID. This was specifically around long COVID. So what we did with all our patients was to implement self-monitoring to try to have the patient reflect on how they felt in terms of that energy, that energy envelope, like Caroline mentioned. Um, we also wanted them to look at other factors. So we, we sort of individualized that to the specific symptoms that people had. So if that was around um, muscle soreness, if that was around mood, if that was around fatigue, we'd want them to look at monitoring those with a simple daily scoring so that they could track how they were feeling and hopefully have a little bit more ownership. Really, we borrowed that model quite a lot from sport where in physiological terms, we look at their daily monitoring readiness rate of perceived exertion if they do any activities. And any prescription advice around exercise is very, very individualized. So we didn't have a program of here's what you'll do on this day and the next day. If someone was at a stage where they thought and we thought we could support them to do a little more physical activity and that would be beneficial, it would very much be a case of advising on small steps and what might motivate and what to watch for in that case and have the patient able to come back if they had questions or concerns. Um, it's been very important and um, it will be very enlightening for us to have the full process of the patients giving their feedback, because really one of the main points of this project was to understand if we were going to meet people's needs. So, you know, we weren't setting out to prove something because we know so little in this sphere. Um, so that feedback will be really important. And I think I'm looking forward to, to that process with the team as well. Um, in terms of negotiating for the needs. So sometimes that would be individually with the patient looking at what they might need 
in the future. We were only from the outset looking at three sessions with patients, so we didn't want to leave them feeling that they had this intervention if it was helpful and they didn't have anywhere else to um, link in. So at that point, linking back in with the community, unless there were another external needs that they had was part of the, the project. Um, so that was the process, and I kind of want to go back to talk about how that fits in. Again, sorry, just on the previous one, if that's okay. Um, about the multidisciplinary team in medicine. So um, in terms of the medics here, um, part of that, and actually the other members of the team did this as well, looking at the history. So we were understanding as best we could about their medical experience of COVID, their psychological experience of COVID. And we wanna make sure that we're looking at any other reasons that they might be having their symptoms. So we know that there are neurological issues. We know that there are inflammatory issues in terms of long COVID, but we also know that we must try to differentiate any specific cardiac respiratory um, involvement. I think a huge part of this project and personally in all my work in long COVID has been to listen. Um, it's been really quite um, humbling to say to most patients with long COVID, look, I'm learning here as well. And very, very often um, we learn from the patients. So I think this is one area where I know there's been concerns and quite validly about people feeling unheard. And I think it is important that we do listen because we're all learning as health professionals here as well. So we're supporting around symptom management. I guess an example I'd give here would be, for example, Caroline mentioned about um, POTS syndrome. So postural orthostatic hypotension, people feeling very dizzy often when they stand up can be one symptom. Um, and it's really quite a horrible symptom. So just basically, despite how much they rest, they might suffer with that. So for example, as a sports exercise medic, something that I might um, advise and other health colleagues would also do this is things like compression types that we use widely in sports can really help isotonic fluids. For some people, they can tolerate quite a high salt diet, obviously depending on the other medical concerns, but things like that can help. And for example, if we're looking at exercise per se, it might be that someone who has, looking back at Caroline's diagram, like quite well controlled symptoms or just on that cusp, maybe one of the first things they might look at doing is something like hydrotherapy so they're not actually actively expending energy swimming yet but they're actually going into water that environment can help people with pots so we're looking at symptom management there are a few things evolving a few sort of trials of different therapies um but that's something that you know we'd feel quite confident to advise on if someone had access and then again it's about learning about their previous physical capacity and what is normal for them in the physiological terms, back in the um, athlete space, we'd be looking at the rate of perceived exertion, someone's heart rate quite assiduously with a heart rate monitor, looking at exercise testing. So in this study, we're not doing those things unless people were monitoring their heart rate before. Um, and we wouldn't be exercise testing in this particular study, but in other studies, that is something that we're looking at. What is happening? We don't quite know. And are people well enough? We do not want to trigger post-exertional symptoms with patients, but this is an area we want to learn. What is, is there a point in recovery? that we can start to turn the wheels a little bit more, but with the brakes on, but with the rest. And like an elite athlete who'll train hard and then rest hard for three days, maybe we need to apply that to a simple walk, a short walk. For my athletic, sporty um, patients, as you might say, understandably, because we, we have this in um, sport exercise medicine, I'll come on to it a little bit more on the next slide, but learning to rest is like really important. Um, so again, we need to encourage that and we need to make sure that there is a balance between that whole lifestyle. I've got that little diagram there looking at sort of physical health um, and psychological health and also social There's health. That's kind of looking at the demands that people um, have in their life. And if you think of it, sometimes it's like three very full cups. We just want to try and stop them from, from spilling over. Can we unload one if we're going to focus on the other? In terms of the psychological impact, we need to really recognise that. As Caroline mentioned, it's really significant. And we know that COVID can both trigger um, neuropsychiatric events on its own. We know it is a cause of anxiety and depression separately. And we also know that some people will have pre-existing anxiety and depression, which may actually not interrelate with their long COVID at all, but may. So those are some of the things that we're exploring. Um, in terms of physiotherapy, brilliant to have physiotherapy on the team, and sometimes we can advise on movement there. In our patients, we want to know what range of movement they've got, for example, have they got any pre-existing um, conditions? Do we need to explain about some simple yoga or Pilates work? And I think one of the fundamentals around um, COVID can be about breath work. So if we have someone who's really flawed by long COVID, really struggling to exercise, or why don't we make some diaphragmatic breathing, that exercise, you've got a time in the day that you set aside to find a quiet space, focus on that. We know that there's a high incidence of 
um, issues with dysfunctional breathing after COVID, be that mild or severe. So that can be a really good place to start. And I think even if we're not talking about exercise, sometimes just bringing that into the day, making sure there's space around it can actually be quite a healthy practice. So that's one of the areas that we might advise on. Lovely Rebecca, I'm sorry to interrupt. I'm really conscious of time and I want to make sure we've got time for some questions. So if I just give you a couple more minutes to, to wrap up. Is that all right? That's, that's a little take, yeah. So we've got occupational therapy on the team. So again, it's really important to look at someone's balance with their lifestyle, other aspects around um, work or family care that they can offload or reduce because we know that that's important to get that balance. And again, looking at nutrition and sleep or other factors, they can be quite disrupted in this condition and something just to look at the hygiene, the practices that people have. So I think the last slide for me is just this next one, Sally, if that's okay. Mm -hmm. So again, I guess these are my main points just to run through really fast, but even in exercise medicine, even in the athletes having to go to the Olympics, rest is really important. And sometimes rest is a big part of a prescription. In sports exercise medicine, we are used to managing athletes who develop a chronic fatigue syndrome. Sometimes that can be post-viral or this syndrome called the under-recovery overtraining syndrome when people really haven't managed to adapt, some maladaptation to exercise and they get this really horrible crushing fatigue really can be quite similar to long COVID fatigue. And we also rehabilitate chronic illness as I've mentioned. So as Caroline said, sometimes we have to wait. But one of the benefits about exercise medicine in that sphere is that we can wait and support and individualize that support and kind of coach someone back into some exercise, often with their coach, sometimes with the individual. As I've mentioned, those are some of the examples um, of what we can do. I think in the background, as an exercise medicine physician, we have to remember the long-term risk of inactivity and that we do have to try to help people, even if it takes a long time, to get back to activity because we don't want them to lose those metabolic, cardiac, protective factors of being active because we've spent so long researching and learning how good it is um, for them. So it's a real balance. It's difficult, but we are learning and this project has hopefully helped us take that a little further. That's me done and over to Sally. <laughs> Oh, thank, thank you, Rebecca. I think I think we'll wrap up there, Anna. Um, there's a number of um, uh, following following ideas about how we're going to pull all this together, but I'm happy to go to questions, and we can come back to that in a bit. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so we've had a few questions in the chat. Um, so I might start. Um, by asking Sally a question, if that's okay. So Roshan has asked a question, Sally, about um, long-term thinking and how long do we think COVID clinics will be running for uh, and who will fund them over the long term as well? Um, thanks, yeah. Um, I'm undertaking an evaluation of the Sheffield NHS long COVID clinic at the moment, and, and I am involved in our regional work. So that's South Yorkshire and Bassett Law, um, at, at ICS. Um, I think it's a difficult one to answer until I've done that work in terms of the evaluation. Uh, how we've set up uh, the, the long COVID clinics in Sheffield is that we've um, set a, a group, a set up, we've set it up based on the population health outcomes. And we're very clear that we want to um, undertake a clinic that is actually regularly transforming to meet the wider needs. So in actual fact, we, we're absolutely committed to community work. We're absolutely committed to managing um on a personalised care, integrated care basis. So we have a very similar integrated care as we do within our, um, as we do within our research clinic. Um, and of course, as you will know, there's a continual challenge about uh, continuous funding. At the moment, we have six months funding. We're looking for funding at an for another year. So through until 22 for certain, I guess the, the long-term vision is that some of our work integrates from long COVID into the other activities that are going on. So we're very involved with the um, MECFS service within the city um, and also for, for older populations within the wider community services and uh, respiratory clinics. Thanks, Sally. That's really helpful. Um, I'm just going to move on to another question here. So, Caroline, you, you've sort of 
answered this a little bit in the chat, but it, I think it would be helpful just to um, to hear hear the answer and hear your thoughts again. So Jeremy's asked, um, are there indications on particular types of physical activity and their effect on long COVID outcomes? Yeah, and I think Jeremy made a really good point. He said, is the, um, you know, what studies have there been that demonstrate what's the best physical activity for long COVID? And the answer is we, we don't know. So the NIHR had a funding round um, just before Christmas and they did fund some studies on looking at exercise in long COVID, uh, but they're quite structured studies. And um, we are very much of the opinion, I think, that this more flexible, personalised approach is more effective and the trouble is that's really really hard to measure because if you do a study where you say oh people are going to jump up and down for 10 minutes a day or something then it's consistent and you can measure it whereas saying oh we're going to do a patient or symptom-led approach and see how it goes it's much much harder to measure it's not impossible to measure um so so really at the moment we're a bit on what people with long COVID tell us works best and and lots of people have said things like yoga tai chi really help things that are more stretching things that are less aerobic things where people are sitting down to it particularly if they have um orthostatic issues like Rebecca mentioned so but it's all a bit anecdotal and no you know um no it's really hard to do a randomized controlled trial on personalized stuff yeah. Brilliant. Thanks, Caroline. Um, Rebecca, can I come over to you with a, a great question here from Tara? Um, so Tara says she works in exercise referral. They tend to categorise people into low, medium or high risk based on the, the referral condition and any comorbidities. If she were to receive a referral from a GP or a doctor, mm -hmm. where would long COVID be on that spectrum of low, medium or high risk? That's a great question. It is a great question. I guess like mm -hmm. everything around COVID it can vary quite a lot. I mean, I would say in terms of like high risk for not meeting the needs by addressing it, then it's kind of high because at the time we want to make sure that we can address all those needs and avoid long-term issues. But in a similar vein, it might not be um, high risk in terms of excluding someone. If they've got quite mild controlled symptoms, it might be actually a great time to refer them. For example, I might, um, I've had a patient who I've said, can we refer to hydrotherapy via their GP? Um, that might be actually that they're not a high risk, you know, they're not um, likely to come to harm that way. So it's, it's being able to stratify that individually. And again, I think we've got to look at their underlying health conditions um, as well, but treat the two as quite separate um, entities. But I think as well, like Caroline said, there's not an immediacy for um, exercise. So I've had a really um, good experience in a separate part of um, a study looking at um, patients, some have been athletic, some have been post intensive care. And actually, sometimes there's been an absolute point to start exercise. And sometimes that has just been gentle work. So sort of very gentle strength based exercise, but there seems to have been and again, totally anecdotal, a turning point. So I think it's almost a case of we can press a pause button, just as long as we don't remember to we remember not to leave it there. So it's a bit of a, a complicated I answer. And I think that actually this turning point is really interesting because some some of the people that um, have been quite public about, oh, you know, I got better from long COVID. Um, I just went for it and suddenly discovered I could exercise. Um, I think they maybe some of those people underestimate the role rest played. That, and the thing is that people say that, you know, they rested and then they got better and then they got off the sofa and started exercising and thought, oh, this is okay. Okay, I can do this. Why was I on the sofa without? Um, to add a bit of complexity, you know, I have in a rare case seen that happen. And you think, oh no, actually rain it back. It's gonna flare symptoms, be careful. And it hasn't, but I think for the most part, it's so um, heterogeneous, as you said, that we yeah. can't sort of be careful. And I think, you know, I've had a few patients and they've kind of said, Oh, it's flat. I don't know why. And then we've actually taken it apart, and it's because they went back to work the week before. They had a stressful yeah. time at home. So it hasn't been the fact that we were gently looking at a little bit of a walk and then a couple of days off. It's been the other aspects. So that kind of comes back to recognizing all the factors. Sometimes it is inexplicable. And I think sometimes dealing with the frustration that they've done everything and it still is. But then again, on the absolute flip side of that, I think sometimes looking at patients, when there is a bit of a turning point, we don't want to extinguish that hope. We've got to have the confidence to acknowledge that when there are good days and when they do kind of follow each other as well. 
it, yeah, it's, it's sometimes there's no pattern in the data, and sometimes there is. But I think this um, this idea that if you're trying to, if people are trying to work and they've still got symptoms, recognizing that all the other things they do in their life really build onto that stress that work's causing them, and um, and it's really really hard to balance trying to go back to work with long COVID and trying to keep going with the rest of your life and enjoying your family life and doing all the things you love doing and and that additional stress of trying to go for a walk or look after your kids or cook meals or is it's really hard you know as well as trying to work I think sometimes you know looking at elite athletes often they absolutely pare down life and they just do their sport mm. and then they eat and then they sleep and it's an existence that you know can be wonderful in some sense but it's also very hard because you know there's not the work element and the family element that sometimes for us is chaotic but um does help sustain but that kind of shows that in that kind of environment where people have a high energy demand or something physical other things have to go by the wayside so i think we will learn about how to get that balance maybe in many other conditions too yeah. Thank you. Um, Sally, can I just put one final question to you? Because we are nearly out of time. You have made a short response already, but um, there's a great question from Elaine. The, the personalised intervention that Caroline described is a, a true multidisciplinary team collaboration. How well set up do you think the NHS is to, to work in that way? Oh, gosh. Well, there's a $24,000 question. Um <laughs> Uh, well, I'm, you know, I'm an organisational scientist, so I'm going to say an organisational scientist type of thing, which is there's high levels of variation. Um, you know, in, so, in some places, there's a close connection between um, the clinical academics and, and people are learning uh, alongside. And in other places, that's not the case. But I would always suggest to anyone um, that this is an opportunity for some really serious networking. Reach out to anyone in your community who's interested in long COVID. Uh, indeed, make contact with the AWRC um, to look at what we're producing and sharing some in these kind of events to kind of partner up. Somebody else said that, you know, they would really like fitness professionals to be involved. And we've had a lot of interest um, particularly working with the more marginalised populations from, from these groups and a lot of interest in this kind of my favourite saying, which is this legitimising inactivity first. Um, and and I, think, I think that's been something that people have really picked up and I think it's picked up on the kind of empathic response as well from the fitness professionals, you know, to really learn and do something slightly differently from what they plan to do. Brilliant. Thank you. So I'm going to draw a line under the uh, the discussion there because we are rapidly running out of time. Um, thank you very much to all the speakers, Caroline, Sally, Rebecca. Uh, your sessions have given us such a, a great insight into some of the challenges and, uh, and some of the real opportunities that lie ahead of us in terms of um, supporting people to recover from long COVID real standout themes around individualized uh, approaches tailoring approaches uh, the value of the multidisciplinary approach so oh, um, you're on <laughs> oh, sorry, sorry you're that's mute, so Anna somebody's it keeps uh, randomly muting it does it keeps randomly muting me um so some um yeah, some, some uh, great themes around multidisciplinary approaches and, and how helpful that is and how that enables people to dial up and dial down various aspects of support. Really important, it sounds, to uh, monitor closely and be able to adapt quickly and respond to, to, to changing patient need. Um, and also just uh, wanted to highlight how we are operating in a, a rapidly changing environment. and We need to remain open to new evidence and um, to really listen and continue learning from our, our patients and participants. So thanks again for uh, to all our speakers. Thank you to the participants in your studies as well, because without them, we wouldn't be here talking tonight. Um, thanks to the National Centre and the faculty for all the work behind the scenes to bring this uh, series of webinars together. And thanks to everyone who's joined us. It's been a really great session.